Thank you all very much for that. It's always a, a, a great delight to have a choir that, that fills many, many pews in a church, something never to be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. One of my most enduring memories of my childhood involves a wall, specifically a very high wall, whitewashed stone that surrounded our property in Dhaka, the capital city of what was then the eastern province of Pakistan where I was born and where I lived for the first five or six years of my life. At the back of that yard, there were stairs along the wall that ran along the wall that led up to the quarters where our servants lived. And on the other side of the wall was a narrow alley that served more or less as our compost pile. As a four or a five-year-old, slightly older than our children are now, I remember very vividly standing on those stairs looking over that wall into that pile of compost and garbage and watching a man in rags digging through our compost and our garbage, presumably looking for something to eat. I should be clear here on one point, the notion of a man rooting through our garbage, perhaps dependent on what we and others threw away for his very survival, did not, did not awaken in my four or five-year-old self an outrage at the injustice of this. I did not demand of my parents some action to balance the social and economic scales that were clearly out of whack. But the memory of that man the image of him bending over and picking through our leftovers has stuck with me. And over the years, it has become something of a sticking point in my conversations with God. There always seems to be this nagging question that continually arises. Why? Why was I on that wall and why was that man in that alley? And because I am largely unsatisfied with theological notions of predestination, it is a question that has gone largely unanswered over the years. But if an answer to why has proved elusive, its durability and persistence has served another purpose. It has profoundly shaped my calling to ministry, my sense of vocation, and my hope for the church. Easy answers to why some of us are born on one side of that wall to lives of privilege and security while others live out their lives on the other side scrambling for whatever scraps we leave behind will probably perpetually elude us, I suspect, if we choose to take them seriously. Indeed, the very ineffability of why can and should invoke in us a desire to respond, an impulse to lend our lives to what the prophet reminds us today is a fast worthy of the Lord we should always dwell on that why question. It is essential to Christian faith, to a Christian faith marked by engagement in the divine resolve for solidarity and communion with all people and to serve faithfully those people in our world who struggle to build lives of hope against the oppressive weight of poverty, violence, pestilence, and famine against everything that tears at the very fabric of God's creation. If the why ultimately eludes us, at least in this world, the why may, excuse me, ultimately elude, elude us in this world. But in this world, God is perhaps better served by our attention to the who and the where and the how of responding to those people on the other side of the wall. That is why I'm here today with you. Because over the past couple of days, more than a few of you have asked me that very necessary question. What is it that appeals to me about serving with you at the First Congregational Church in Madison? Here's a short answer. Several months ago, I came across your listing in the wonderfully named Opportunities page on the United Church of Christ website. The first sentence read this, thus. The members of the First Congregational Church of Madison serve God by serving others. You may be familiar with this. If you're not, I'll say it again because we're all adult learners and two or three times are necessary, right? <laughs> the members of the First Congregational Church 
of Madison, Connecticut. Serve God by serving others. Many of, you, many of you are familiar with these words. Many of you, more importantly, have given them substance. The members of First Congregational Church in Madison serve God by serving others. I was captivated. In the very real and literal sense of that word, I thought instantly of standing on that wall as a child. And I thought more about it. And then I thought, upon reflection, of the great Christian martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote famously that only by living completely in this world can a Christian truly learn what it means to be faithful. Only by turning towards others are we authentically faithful. Only by loving the world as God loves the world are we truly faithful to God. And I thought of this passage from Isaiah and its soaring promise that our light will rise only when we set aside self-regard and throw ourselves unreservedly into the arms of God by loving and serving the world that God loves so dearly. And then my wife showed me a story, a story from the ancient Hasidic tradition, which I will share, which I will, um, share with you and leave you with this morning. A long, long time ago, the story goes, in a mountain village very, very far away, a nobleman lived, and as he grew into old age, there grew in him a desire to leave something permanent behind, something that would outlive him in the life of his village. So he decided to build a synagogue, a place of gathering and prayer for the people of his community. But he decided that in order for the synagogue to thrive, for the community to prosper, there had to be something very, very special about it. He told no one of his plans. Architects and builders were sworn to secrecy. Secrecy, of course, is not an entirely appropriate in covenantal relationships like ours, I know, but it's a long story and an old one. So nothing would be known about this synagogue, nothing until the building was finished. So under a veil of mystery, construction began. Day and night, the builders worked until the new synagogue was finished. You can imagine the excitement. The village was abuzz. Everyone was curious, filled with expectation and wonderment. What would they find when they entered the new synagogue? Lines of people stretched around the wall the morning of the grand opening. Finally, the doors were thrown open and the townspeople poured in. They marveled at the synagogue's magnificence. No one could ever remember so beautiful a synagogue anywhere in the world. They gazed at the intricate designs and the beautiful windows. They were in awe of the craftsmanship and the attention to almost every detail. Until one of the villagers noticed a flaw, a pretty obvious flaw, as it turns out. Where are the lamps? What will we do for light? How will we see? There was a hush at first. Then the murmuring began. You have built such a beautiful building, they said, but how could you forget the lamps? How can we worship? How can we gather? How can this be? There was some nervous laughter, a few giggles. Many heads shook in dismay. The nobleman waited. Another hush came over the congregation. And then he pointed to all of the brackets placed throughout all of the walls in the synagogue. You bring the light, he told them. Whenever you come, I want you to bring your lamp and your light will fill this space. But each time you are not here, he said, a part of this place will be dark. Every time you are absent, some part of God's house 
of this community will be in darkness. We are relying on you for your light. First Congregational Church of Madison serves God by serving others. The light of this church has shined for more than three centuries, I am told. Your light has shined in this community and beyond her borders, manifesting the love of God in the building of homes, the feeding of the hungry, and the care for the sick and the grieving, both in your midst and outside of your walls. Your light has shined in your welcome to the marginalized, the outcast, and the left out. In a world that so often seems threatened by darkness, dear friends, it is so natural for us to turn inward, to allow fear and concern to dampen our lamps. It is natural at times to, pr to preserve the light for ourselves. But in this time, more perhaps than any other time in recent memory, the world needs the light of this church. It needs your light. It needs our light. It needs courage and compassion. It needs voices willing to speak back to darkness and evil, prayers of compassion and mercy, arms and legs and shoulders to rebuild ancient ruins. It needs your imagination, your creativity, your resources, your time, and your faith. We are a church, after all, that takes as our central image the cross, this symbol that God does not stand far off and aloof from the life of the world. And if God is not content to stand far off, not content to love at a safe distance, dear friends, then neither should we. The world needs our light. It is relying on us to offer something for which people are starving. For a word of welcome, an offer of care, a place to live, food to eat, hospitality and fellowship to share. More than ever, the world needs our light, dear friends. And I look forward to the opportunity of finding new ways for our light to shine in the years to come. Thank you all again, and thanks be to God. Amen.